and announcements today. All right, to allow everyone to plan ahead of time, please mark the 24th and the 26th of June on your calendars this early as we will be holding our VBS kickoff event on the Friday the 24th and our 62nd church anniversary on the 26th. Promotional materials for our summer activities are available for distribution. Please see Barb or Michelle if you wish to volunteer in handing them out. We encourage everyone to please join us for our Wednesday prayer meeting from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., which is being held remotely for the time being. Those interested in attending may send an email to infodesk at midlandparkbaptist.com for the link. We thank you all for your faithfulness to the Lord in supporting the work of the gospel here at Midland Park in these difficult days through your prayers, in your various efforts to promote the gospel, and in your faithful offerings. Now let's just take a few moments to prepare our hearts and our minds in silence as we enter into God's holy presence on this Lord's Day. Our call to worship today will be from Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Shout triumphantly to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that Yahweh is God. He made us and we are his. His people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for Yahweh is good, and his love is eternal. His faithfulness endures through all generations. From Psalm 100. We thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Let us all stand for the first hymn, Come Thou Almighty King. Great one in three, 
His praises be, and evermore, His sovereign majesty may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. Seated. Let us pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, as we would again come into your holy presence on this Lord's Day, we would plead with you, O oh God, that you would prepare our hearts in our minds and our whole beings to be fixed on you and your eternal throne at this time. We pray, O oh God, that you would remove from within us any distractions that may lie there and remove any distractions that may come our way. We pray, Lord, that you would remove the evil one from us at this time and that you would help us as we continue in your presence to sing your praises, to read your word, and to proclaim your word in a manner that would bring you honor, glory, and praise. So, Father, we pray that you would search us, O God, and know our hearts at this time. Try us and know our anxieties and see again if there would be any wicked way in us. Remove it far from us and continue to lead us, O oh God, in the way everlasting. Put a guard in our thoughts and a rein in our tongue. And may all that we do in thought, word, and in deed this day bring you honor, glory, and praise. And as we continue to Proclaim your word as we continue to read your word and sing your word. Father, help us by the power of your spirit to do so with the fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we pray that you would bless us at this time and that you would give us your word is a blessing and so that we may be able to take it home and that we may be able to use it with others that you bring our way this day. Help us, O oh God, to continually be alert and attentive to the opportunities that come our way by keeping us focused on you and you alone and not this busy world that we are so often involved in. So be especially with our pastor, O oh God, at this time, that you would help him to proclaim your word in a manner with clarity so that we would have a great understanding of it and take it to this lost world and community that we serve. We thank you again for the great salvation that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that you continue to provide salvation for your people. And we pray this day that many, O oh God, by the proclamation of your word and the power of your spirit, would be again resurrected from their spiritual deadness in trespasses and sins and made alive unto you, your word and your ways. And again, may you always get the honor and the glory and the praise in building your church here at the corner of Broccoli and Treewood and around the world. In the mighty name of Christ, we pray these things. Amen. Our scripture reading today will be from Psalm 67, 1 to 7. Psalm 67, 1 to 7. And this is a responsive reading. God, be merciful to us and bless us and cause your face to shine upon us.
O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Amen. Let us all stand for the second hymn, Worthy is the Lamb. Now I'll ask our pastor to come forward with the message that he has. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you especially because you received the notice for you to lead at the last minute. So thank you. Thank you also, Andrew. Thank you, David, for being here. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Do I see a stranger over there? Frida. Oh, very welcome, Frida. We missed you a lot. Good to see you today. So welcome. Welcome, everyone, as well. So, um, some of you may remember Brother Ed and Sister Virgie. They have been faithful members with us for a long time. They serve as deacons in this church, but after uh, retirement, they move to be with their children, to be close to them. So, they're now in Saskatchewan, but they haven't forgotten us. And uh, they sent us a wonderful card thanking God for our friendship and also a very generous uh, offering. So, dear friends at uh, Midland Park Baptist Church, you are truly a wonderful friend and we are so blessed to have you in our lives if I ever needed proof of God's love, you are it. I hope this finds you all well. We are fine by God's grace. May God find us all faithful in Christ, Ed and Virgie. So the address, their address is still updated. You can find it in the board. And if you want to send them a note of what or what not, you can, you're free, you're, you're free to do so. So, and also let's remember Ber Bernice. Bernice, if you remember, uh, came to this church a long time ago together with her daughter Alma. She is 97. She was rushed to the hospital a couple of days ago to the emergency and because she collapsed, but uh, she's still under observation. And uh, um, we still haven't heard word from her yet. And also, let's remember Joan. Joan is, uh, is uh, quite okay. She has lost, according to Suzanne, that's her daughter, she has lost uh, quite some weight. 
but uh, overall she needed uh, uh, more encouragement which if you would like to give her a call that would be nice also um, what else yes um, I keep forgetting Anna some of you may not be aware that she had a fall accident uh, a couple weeks back and you may notice she is wearing a cast she is on the mend she broke her wrist so we thank God for uh, healing her though slow it may be so we'll remember her in prayer as well let's recite our memory verse for today shall we Psalms 86 and verse 9 all nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you O Lord and shall glorify your name Psalm 86 and verse 9 we give thanks to the Lord for his continued faithfulness the work of the Lord here in this place by sustaining us and the offering we had last Sunday is indicated in your bulletin for which we give thanks let's now prepare our hearts to continue in our rendering of our sacrifices of worship let us pray our dear father in heaven Abba the fact alone that we can call you our Abba is such a wonderful privilege for we were children of the devil one time in our lives but yet you adopted us and you've given us the new birth and that you have brought us back to life to worship you so Lord help us that every waking moment and every breathing moment that we have that what we breathe out will be glory and praises to your name thank you once again for allowing us even at this time when we have such freedoms to do so and we are reminded once again oh god that in other places where our brothers and sisters gather together in such difficulty because of persecution because of oppression and hindrance even because of conflicts and even as we speak O oh lord we are aware that we have brothers and sisters in those places of conflicts right now in the Middle East, in Yemen, in Africa, in the Balkans, even in Ukraine and Russia and many other places. And we pray, Lord, that you will strengthen them, strengthen the churches to continue to be bright and shining testimony to your name and to proclaim faithfully the word of salvation the sweet words of salvation in Christ alone. Help us also as a church to be more faithful to you, to stand up to the challenge only by your mercy and your grace and your strength, not of our own ability. And so help us, Lord, to worship you, to stand in awe of who you are, manifest once again the glory that you had as in the past. Shock us, O oh God. Take us, Lord, into your presence to see how wonderful, how beautiful you are. So we praise you for all your excellencies. We praise you because of your long suffering and your compassion and your love. We thank you because you are a pardoning God. For who is a pardoning God like thee? While people cannot get themselves to forgive, and we can't even forgive ourselves, Lord, you have forgiven us. And for that, 
we give you back all the praise and the glory. Thank you, Lord, for the Lord Jesus Christ to make all of these things happen. And you have put it in your heart long, long time ago before you created this universe to set it upon yourself to love us eternally under no conditions at all. And for that, Lord, help us to, to give back all the praise and the glory to you and all the thanksgiving by our obedience, by our love, by our serving you, honoring you, following your word. And we thank you because you are a God of mercy. And as we speak, Lord, we do realize that we are a people in need. And we thank you in so many ways you have granted us and given us, provided for us all that we need in such a way that we can say before you that we lack nothing. And so, Lord, we thank you for all your daily provisions to us, food and table, safety and security as we move around our business. Thank you, Lord, for your continuing protection against the evil one and thank you also for the freedoms we enjoy the air we breathe the sun shine the rain the snow and for the love in Christ and so Lord we come before you knowing that you alone are our healer and so Lord we pray your healing hand upon burnings at this time that you will have mercy upon her and if it so pleases you you will add more years to her life but this is all in your hands oh god that's why we just ask you that you will re restore her health may you continue to watch over encourage alma as she cares for her mom may you g give her all the ability and the graces to do so. Sustain her, O oh God. And we pray also for Joan at this time. We pray that you may continue to encourage her by the word, even as she goes into the word every day, that may you use this to continue to remind her that she is not alone. We are all not alone because you are with us and you yourself have promised that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And so, Lord, may your spirit be upon Joan, and even as she continues to serve you in her way at this moment. And we pray also for uh, Stuart and uh, their family, even as they have moved last uh, Thursday, that uh, indeed you will uh, go before them, watch over them, guide them, and that uh, all the arrangements regarding uh, transportation, going to work, coming to church will be uh, done and you will grant uh, uh, th those uh, means available to Stuart and Beverlyn. And also we uh, bring before your throne of grace, Anna. We thank you for protecting her in her fall accident and now she is on demand. We pray that you will uh, continue to heal her, bring her back to health so she can regain the full function of the use of her hand. And we trust only in you, O oh God, as uh, you are our only healer, and you can use all the means available for our uh, health. And now, O oh God, we continue to thank you for your faithfulness to us. And we thank you also for using people, using each and every one who are here. Use our brother Ed and sister Virgie, though they are far away in Saskatchewan, that they are still very much a part of this work. And we thank you, Lord, for the sacrifices and the, and the generosity of heart you have given to your people so they may be used to support the work here in this place and so see ourselves even 
not be able to see ourselves long after this generation, that this work will continue. Lord, continue to make the fire of your spirit burning in the midst of this congregation. And so see that the gospel proclaimed out of this place and that in the proclamation of your gospel, your people will be strengthened and encouraged and those who are yet not in your fold will be called into the fold and be saved and be glorified, O God, in the salvation of sinners. For we pray all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. preparation for our uh, continuing study on the book of Romans, we will sing, tell me the old, old story. Tell me the old, old story. So, thank you. Please all be seated. So, please turn your Bibles on you to Romans chapter 10. We will continue our study on this particular passage and because we well that's the richness of the word of God isn't it we can stay on one verse and keep uh, expounding on it and we will never run out of God's wisdom and God's counsel to benefit us in our days so um, Join me, please, in prayer before we proceed. Let us pray. 
O Holy Spirit, you spoke to the prophets and the apostles of old, and you are alone who is the author of your word, and you alone, O God, can teach us. So open our minds, give us willing hearts and teachable minds that we will be open to your word today and be blessed by it. And so we ask all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the year 1786, that's quite a long, long time ago, a group of English Baptist ministers or pastors gather who were gathering regularly. They were confronted by a young pastor who said to them, why don't we take up the topic of whether the command given to the apostles to teach all nations was not binding on all succeeding ministers to the end of the world. And then some of the pastors in that fraternal, and by the way, if you're wondering about Pastors Fellowship, Pastors Fraternal. They are, they, it has been practiced a long, long time ago, like centuries ago. Here's the thing about our world today. We take it as if the world was born yesterday. No. <laughs> Just a very uh, cursory study of history will tell us that the things that are happening in the past can be traced all the way to its origins in the past and will help us to understand and be aware and appreciate our place in time and at the same time our own look at all of this in the light of scripture. So anyways, there was a group of pastors in the pastor's fraternal who told this young man, and it may have been apocryphal, there's no verification as to whether those words indeed were said, but the sentiment was there. The, the apocryphal version was that some of the pastors said to this young man, sit down, young man. If God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do so without consulting you or me. Now, these are a group of pastors who I will be 100% in agreement with in terms of doctrine. Because theoretically speaking, from the point of view of human reasoning, that seems to be the human conclusion out of a belief of the sovereignty of God. Because technically speaking, God will make a certain person, a certain sinner, a true believer without you or me. True? Yes, because first nine chapters of the book of Romans is a very a straightforward, very logical uh, argumentation on the fact that God is sovereign and he saves sinners from beginning to end. In fact, the beginning of that salvation, that work of salvation, happened long before, even before the creation of the world. And so the story continues. Five years later on, in 700, 1791, many of the other pastors were becoming more influenced by this young man to do the work of proclaiming the gospel to places that England already has colonized and occupied. And so this person was asked to preach, and he preached on Isaiah chapter 54, verses 2 and 3. On the passage, enlarge the place of thy tent. And he ended his preaching with his very words, as is often quoted, Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. If you go downtown to Toronto Baptist Seminary, you will see that emblazoned on those banners, those words. But then, 
several of the men were still not yet convinced. And it came to a point in the, in the spring of 1792, finally, finally, with the help of the three men, probably we are not, probably haven't heard of them, but they were pillars. They were pillars of this Baptist group, the, 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 the original Baptist group, if I may say this. Uh, John Suscliffe, uh, uh, who's this other guy, uh, uh, Andrew Fuller. They formed, they formed the Baptist Society for Mission Work in India. And that man's name is William Carey. He's quite a famous guy in India, by the way. You, you would remember him. Well, William Carey was a particular Baptist. Everybody wants to own him, but uh, I'm not trying to be bariotic. But William Carey was a particular Baptist, which is a Reformed Baptist. And this group of ministers were the uh, Reformed Baptist Association at that time. And it eventually evolved into the Grace Baptist Mission, which is still existing as we speak in England. But there ha they have to go through a lot of issues in history. But the, the short and long of it is that, because of the efforts of this man, the gospel was preached in India. And his labors is, is legendary, so to speak. It is the topic of many missionary uh, books and so on and so forth. Now, in a sense, we are indebted to workers in the gospel who has spread the words in places it hasn't been heard of. I, for one, come from a place that has been missioned. But if we are looking into the uh, situation right now, we see that the mission countries right now are the missioners, meaning to say, the very places who have been sending missionaries are now in need of missionaries. So it's just a, uh, a sort of a back pay. Now, of course, we are in this topic of uh, Romans chapter 10 about the proclamation of the word. Now, we'll get back into context. That story inspires us. We are indebted to them in so many ways because of the work that they did and the work that God enabled them to do. We can derive some motivation from their stories. We can de derive some inspiration, as I've said. So the next question we will probably be asking is, what about us in the present? That, that thing happened in the past, centuries ago, and its effect still lasts on until now. But then what about our own situation? What about our circumstances? Let, just let me say this. There can only be one William Carey, okay? Like, there can only be one Elvis Presley. Go to Las Vegas and you will see a lot of impersonators. They will look like Elvis Presley. They may even sound like Elvis Presley, but they are not Elvis Presley. So what's the point of raising up William Carey? But there was a point, there was a purpose. Now the purpose is not for us to be, you know, do another William Carey because that's not going to happen. But God will have something for us to do in our way, in his way, in our situation, in our time, in, in the propagation of the gospel. There can only be one William Carey, as there can only be one Charles Spurgeon, one Martin Lloyd-Jones, one Jonathan Edwards, one George Whitfield. Why is that? And I guess because when God made us, he only made one of each. I just dread the thought of knowing there are more than one Steve in the world. No. The world is not enough for two Steves, so to speak. But anyways, so what would this part of the word of God in Romans chapter 10, 13 to 21, apply to us today? Because as we speak, 
Whenever, I, whenever we hear the word missions or evangelism, we have all sorts of ideas. The reason for that is because we have a long history behind us of all of these practices, all of this belief, all of this tradition. And so, for instance, if I speak about evangelism, there are many things that crowd in our heads, things like uh, revival, uh, evangelistic crusades. And if you would want to know some history about it, it all started in the 1800s in the so-called tent meetings of Charles Finney and all of this his companion. So, like I said, whenever we speak about evangelism in a Christian circle, we all have our own definition, our own whole idea, and uh, evangelism may be this or maybe that, and you might have heard about it, that uh, uh, a thing about e evangelism, we think of TV evangelists, TV evangelism, or Perhaps you might have heard about the ways how to do it. Uh, uh, soapbox evangelism. Have you heard about soapbox evangelism? Uh, they will say, give me a soapbox to stand on and I will evangelize. Or the screen door evangelism, where you don't need to really, you just knock and if, <laughs> if the guy's friendly and the door open and it's enough for them to open the screen and you do evangelism. Or the three minute evangelism, I don't know. Is it like the three minute egg? or the uh, commando evangelism, or stranger evangelism, what not evangelism, we would be surprised that the list goes on and on and it has become a sort of a specialized way, you know, strategies and programs. But let us not get caught in that uh, forest of traditions and practices and opinions and, and, and some of them probably, I cannot say for sure, can be use of God, certainly. But we need to avoid two extremes. One extreme is a worked up conscience that is driven by that sense of guilt, of failure to go from house to house, knocking on doors to hand out evangelistic tracts. I have to be clear on this. Because to be honest, you don't have to give me your answer, but let me ask you, has anyone here really did that in their whole Christian lives at all? You know, knocking on doors like a vacuum cleaner salesman selling the gospel? Have anyone done that? Maybe some of you did. But what about those who haven't even done that even once? Just try to imagine the kind of harm, a kind of a guilt working up preaching on you people telling you that the only evangelism to do is do door to door knocking on doors. Not because I didn't do it, I did it in the past when I was a younger Christian. I talked to a group of drunkards drinking on the street in the open because that's legal by the way in the Philippines. You can drink out in the street and drinking. I sat down with them, I spoke to these drunkards. But what about those who are not really into it? So we have to avoid that extreme. We have to avoid that extreme of, you know, uh, working up the guilt of some real Christians, you know, to, to have that feeling of failure because they didn't do house to house. And I will speak to that uh, much later because uh, as if it were, the, the definition of evangelism has been narrowed down to house to house knocking on doors. Try that with someone else wearing a coat and tie and you might be probably be mistaken for someone else. But is, is that what proclamation of the gospel really is? Now we'll take this one at a time, there's so much a load of material to do so, and in the amount of time we have today, I'd like us first to focus on the more basic important things. So that's one extreme to avoid. The other extreme to avoid are the kind of an attitude that this some pastors had in 1791 in their response to William Carey. I wouldn't want to agree with them on that even though I would agree with them on the 1689 Confession of Faith. 
Because in the truth, yes, God will save unbelievers without you or me, but then on the one hand, God will find a way to use his people to undertake this great commission. So we will avoid those two extremes. So where do we begin? Where do we begin? Now, let me just make a suggestion. Let's just assume for a moment that we know nothing about evangelism, we know nothing about missions, and that we are the original recipients of the letter of Paul to the Romans. So let us, as it were, clear the slate and then forget about evangelistic crusades, forget about TV evangelists, and forget about the whole idea that in our Christian world have on evangelism and missions. And let's clear our memory cache, so to speak, and do a reset. Let's take, let's take a step back, because Romans chapter 10 is right in front of us, and it's a big picture. And let's take a look at it from the big, bigger perspective. If you've been to the Louvre, museum in Paris, there's the biggest room or the state room. It is the biggest room to accommodate, and the reason for that is for two reasons, to accommodate as many people as possible visitors because in that state room is the display of the Mona Lisa. That's the most looked at picture in the world. But in the other room, across the room, is a very big picture. It's entitled The Wedding Feast of Cana by the artist Veronese. And it's so big, you have to step backwards in order to see the picture. Because if you stand right in front of it, you will just see the jog of a woman uh, the jug uh, being held by a woman, and if you step a little back here, you will just see uh, some little kids playing. But if you walk backwards and see the whole thing, you will see the beautiful picture. Now, if you've been to Paris, don't miss that on the Louvre. I like that better than Mona Lisa in the state room. But anyways, this is how we want to do it. Let's step back, look at the, 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 the context, and let's read it over again and see the big picture of Romans chapter 10, 14 to 16. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So, it's very clear here, we'll just tackle two points today, that the word has to be proclaimed. And not only, has, not only does this topic, that, that this, this passage shows to us that the word has to be proclaimed. It has to be proclaimed in God's way. Now, that is a very important consideration here. Now, the context, let me just walk through back very quickly what happened in this context or what's happening in this context is that the Apostle Paul is dealing with the present rejection of the Jews. Now, of course, this is not something that is, that is uh, new. It has been happening Ever since, from the time the patriarchs uh, formed the nation of Israel, even to the time of Jesus, that they repeatedly rejected the message of God and rejected the messengers of God. In Romans chapter 10, verse 16, we read that. But not all Israelites accepted the good news, did they? For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our message? So even during the time of the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah was bringing to them the good news of deliverance from the captivity in Babylon. They were already, you know, the no guys. They would always say no to God, no to those whom God will send over to them, no to the message that God sent through them. So Romans chapter 10, verse 18, we also read that. Uh, their voice, they can't, did they not hear? Of course they did. They are not rejecting the gospel. 
the message of God because they didn't hear, they didn't hear, because their voice had gone out into the world. Who, whose voice are they? The voice of the prophets, the voice of those messenger bearers have gone out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. So, but then we have to understand that their rejection did not up at all reflect the measure of grace of God. It's not because the grace of God was limited or the grace of God was only enough for them, but it was more than their hardness of heart. We are familiar with this verse, uh, Matthew chapter uh, 23, Jesus himself pleading with Jerusalem. Listen to how Jesus pleaded with Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets. This group of people who are the most blessed, who are the most uh, uh, favored, are the ones who themselves are the most uh, uh, antagonistic. It is like, you know, uh, you know that, that, that saying, biting the hand that feeds you? They were not just biting the hand of God that was feeding them. They were taking not just the arm, but the whole person and then killing the prophets. So the Apostle Paul, in this context, just to go back into context, is laying down the culpability of the nation of Israel in rejecting the gospel in Christ because even though they have received it all, and they were in fact part and parcel of redemptive revelation. We cannot talk about the plan of salvation without talking about the Israelites, the Jews, and, and things like that. We're taking that up uh, 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 last time. Now, from this context, what we see is this verse. The verse that captures everything in terms of answering those two extremes of fatalism and free willism. I ran out of words to describe that kind of a belief of saying that everything depends on me and I, and I make things happen and I can make one believer because of my cleverness and smartness and my strategy and my eloquence and whatnot. That is free willism and fatalism on the other side were those group of pastors in 1791 who said to William Carey, said, Downing man, if God wants to save those people, he will do that without you and me. So as an indictment of the, of the hardness of heart and rejection of the gospel that, by the, the Jews, we see this in context, and Paul mentions this verse to answer those questions in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How can one be saved? Of course, God will open your heart first. But then if God opens your heart, how would you know the gospel if it is not preached to you? That's the whole point here of Paul. So then it answers two questions. How do I know I'm a Christian? Well, check it out. What is your reaction to the word of God when the word of God is preached to you? How do I know I am an elect? Well, you responded positively to the word of God. That is how simple this uh, powerful argument of Paul that there is an absolute necessity of the preaching of the word. Jesus cannot be learned without the preaching of the word. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch was right in Isaiah chapter 53 and he was reading it over and over again and then Philip was sent over by the spirit to run. Imagine Philip running with the chariot, he was so, so, fa so fast doing that. But anyways, the point is that the Ethiopian eunuch said, how can I know this unless someone says, teaches me this? And so Philip, the evangelist, taught him Isaiah 53, right then and there. So here Paul emphasizing that absolute necessity of preaching the word of God because there is a kind of 
I don't know, believe today that you can learn Jesus by a dream. You can learn Jesus by a vision in the sky. You can learn Jesus by the, uh, you know, things we see in our eyes. No, it is here in the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We'll hear more about this as we move along. So, does it mean that because of this verse, one can believe on his own? If, see, the thing is this. The word of God is presented to everyone. If one comes to believe, it is because of this. One of these listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God, a Jewish proselyte. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Those two things must come into play in order for true conversion to happen. Preaching to an open heart, that's fact of reality, and it happens. And so anyone who wants to share the gospel shouldn't feel rejected, shouldn't feel bad. Even if that person is close to you, would say no to your gospel. Because those things are out of our hands. Now, if we begin, even begin to think that we blame ourselves for someone not being a Christian, then something is terribly doctrinally wrong in that kind of thinking. Because of what? This verse. So, our prayer should include, open the hearts of those whom you will bring along for me or for us to share the gospel to. So, there's, see the order? Opening of a heart. And then the word comes along and the heart is receptive, rece receptive and, and uh, is accepted. So the word has to be proclaimed. And it does not stand in contradiction to the doctrine of the sovereignty of God or in the doctrine of the responsibility of man. Now let me just say this very clearly. We are not in the business of recruiting members to the church. That, that's not our business at all. It is the prerogative of who? The head of the church. Christ is the one who adds to his body and Christ is the one who removes from his body. Now we will just have to obey his word and implement his will in that area. The removing of course has something to do with church discipline. And I been there before a little bit, I guess, something to revisit once again, because somehow in a wider uh, consideration among churches, church discipline is frowned upon, even if it is taught in scripture. But then that would be another conversation in another day. What I like to focus here right now is that we are not in the business of recruiting hundreds. Evangelism is not about soul winning. You've heard about soul winning. No. Because if I am able, I have the power to convert because of my charisma or my eloquence of speech or my smartness and cleverness of my logical, logically arranged argumentation, then who gets the credit? Me. Why was he a believer? Because of me. If I start to sound like that, don't be surprised if a lightning bolt will strike me right away because that is robbing God of his glory. Souls have already been warned. How do we know that? Well, the word of God tells us. On the cross, Christ achieved that victory over hell, sin, and Satan. He has already paid in full and secured the victory for every true believer, a member of his people. And any thought of evangelism as if it is on our hands, of course, we have responsibility. That's, uh, that's something we've already been uh, um, uh, 
accepting all this while. But if we put it in our hands, then that goes against what we've been reading, reading all this while. God alone gets the glory. We do share the gospel, but here's one thing that one Puritan said, what we are in the process of the new birth is that we are midwives. What do midwives do in the birthing process? They just assist in the birth. So we assist those who are being born again by, you know, leading them to the word, leading them to the preaching of the word, leading them to Christ. So in a sense, I am a midwife looking at you, speaking to fellow midwives. We are not creators of Christian. We are not recruiting. I don't want to recruit anyone to come here. Because why? I will be indebted to their presence here. No. God will give, will add people to his church. It's his choice. It's his final say. And why is that also? Because those who are truly born again, whom God has brought to the church, will be the true, real deal. Let me take you to one passage. They had a few converts, or God already had uh, Crispus and a few other families in Corinth, and they were having a hard time, the missionary group of Paul and Barnabas. But listen to the words in Acts chapter 18, 7 to 11. Then Paul left the synagogue, and that's the customary way when they do mission work. They didn't do house to house. They went directly to the place or the forum where these things can take place, where you can have more time in reasonable discussion, reasonable exposition of the word. So they went to the synagogue and went next door to the house of teachers, Justice, who apparently lived next door to the synagogue. And, and Crispus, the synagogue ruler, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul. Now, this is not repeatable, by the way, when wanting to know where to go, you don't have to wait for a vision or a dream that happened only during the time of the apostles. We'll talk more about that because somehow today, anything goes as it were. If it sounds okay, yeah, go ahead with it. Dreams, vision. No, what does the word of God say? And here, we are trying to work these things out. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, do not be afraid, keep on speaking. Apparently, they were already getting discouraged. Do not be silent, for I am with you. This is the most important thing in the Great Commission. This is found there, the promise of, uh, of, uh, of God being with the church all the time. And no one is going to attack or harm you because I have... This is this is, one, this is the more important thing here in this context. I have many people in this city. Wow. Praise the Lord. Are these people already in the church? No. Are they already born again in a sense? Probably not. But are they elect? Certainly. Have Paul and Barnabas met these people yet? No. That's why God here is saying, you will meet this. I will bring them to you and they will, I will bring them to you and I will bring you to them and then they are my people. Meaning to say, I have won them for you. So if I will read this passage, for instance, and say, the business of Paul is to win the souls of these people in Corinth is wrong. It's not in our capacity, in our ability, in our powers to win souls. It is God already have done that. God has already won and secured and redeemed those who are his. In that only that in the timeline, there are still those who are still in their sin and they need to hear Christ and they need the word of God preached to them and God 
has opened their hearts already. This is the whole balance we have to be aware of. Otherwise, we can run, run without being sent. That is very, very important. The word has to be proclaimed in his way. The problem with man, and even <laughs> sad to say, those who say they are believers, is they are inventive, they're very clever. I have no doubt at all how artistic, how inventive, how, how uh, imaginative man is. We all get that. I am an appreciator of arts and music. But when it comes to the preaching of the word of God, it is not open to our imagination. God has already said it very plainly in clear terms. And by the way, I'll speak on this in a little bit, that these words are not suggestions. These are for us to do what? To listen and to obey. But then does that save us? No. It just shows that you are born again because you are born again with an obedient heart. So why is it important that, let's go back to Romans chapter 10, and they, how can they preach unless they are sent? To be sent and to have been sent is the most important thing in preaching and in proclamation of the word of God. Why is it very important? Why is it very crucial and non-negotiable that those who bear God's word be sent? Because of this. In Jeremiah, there was a proliferation of false prophets and false teachers. And God's wrath was upon them and he judged them. And he said these words to these kinds of prophets, I did not send these prophets. Can someone, you know, preach the gospel and, and, and prophesy? Sure, why not? You know, perhaps it has come to you like a thunderbolt, shaking your whole feeling that you have to go to Iceland and do mission work there, and you cannot just sleep over it, and you have to do it. Fine. Maybe that's what God is doing in your life. But we have to settle first the sendingness of the whole thing. Because this can happen. God can judge our actions the same way he judged those false prophets. I did not send these prophets, but they ran ahead. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. Anyone can be a preacher. Let, let me just tell you. And I know some, no churches in particular, and I'm not saying this to, you know, to, uh, for any other uh, uh, reason, but just simply as an illustration that one of the strategies to grow a church is to give them importance, give them something to do, give them a title, give them a, a preacher kind of thing, even though they, they have a vaguest idea of these kinds of verses. And yeah, people like importance. People like, uh, you know, uh, attention. All of us do. That's part of who we are. But the thing is that when it comes to working for the Lord, these are the kinds of very clear we need to go by and obey. The reason for this, why God is is angry at those self-sent uh, preachers is this it is not my word it's not my word like fire declares the lord and like a hammer which shatters a rock therefore behold i am against the prophets declares the lord who steals my words from each other behold i am against the prophets declares the lord who use their tongues and declare the lord declares Behold, I am against those who have prophesied false dreams, declares the Lord, and related them, and led my people astray by their falsehood and reckless boasting. Yet I did not send them, 
nor command them, nor do they furnish this people the slightest benefit, declares the Lord. And so Paul takes the argument, he uses it not just to describe the present rejection of the Jews of the message they've been hearing over the generations, but also to expose their indictment that they cannot escape the fact that they cannot have an excuse because they received the message from the messenger who were sent by God to them. It is crucial that those who bear God's word must be sent because of what is at stake. Here in this passage we see that. What is at stake here? The name and honor of the sender. It's very uh, simple if we take a look at a human situation. Some of you are familiar with the power or special power of attorney. The special power of attorney is a sort of a document saying to some people, I can't be able to do the thing if I do it, if I have to do it uh, physically present, but I have someone else to do that for me. So I'll hand him or her a sort of a SPA or a special power of attorney empowering him or her to represent me in things like this or that. Now, if, for instance, there is nothing said in that special power of attorney for that person who is an attorney, in fact, where to do, then that would be what? That would make me angry or upset. No, 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 don't do that. I don't tell you to do that. That's not in the power of attorney. You're only to do what is in the power of attorney. Now, we understand that on a human level, right? Now take that to the message of the word of God. Take that to the proclamation and preaching of the word of God. And here we see that importance of being sent because what is at stake is the honor and name of the sender and the truth of the message. If one isn't sent from God, then that message he is bearing is false. Even the Pharisees understood this. They applied this to Jesus, by the way. They questioned him. So when Jesus was preaching, doing miracles, they questioned him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked. Who gave you this authority to do this? So even Jesus, they, they body checked him, sort of. Who sent you, Jesus? And Jesus, in many instances, said this. I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. So imagine Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, God himself, has to work along the same principle of being sent. Jesus wouldn't even come to the point of arrogating to himself that message, even though he is the messenger of all messengers, he himself acknowledged that he was sent from the Father. He who sent me is true, the Father, and the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize that they have been speaking to them about the Father. Jesus therefore said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father has taught me, because He sent me. So I guess I've been hammering too much on this horse, and it's now dead. Just to point out the importance of being sent, because... Nowadays, we have all sorts of philosophies out there, good as it is, and value, have value in a way that have, you know, influenced the way we do God's work. See, the volunteering system in this society is one of the community pillars of progress. We all know what that means, right? Well, the benefit of it is that nobody is forced to do anything. 
you know, you want to volunteer to do this, to do that, fine, go ahead. We're all for it. And it's usually volunteering for good. Nice, nice. Nice concept. You know, uh, because one didn't need to be forced to do it. One has to be convinced first of the value of the action to volunteer to do it for the greater good. But let me just say this. Preaching the word of God, proclaiming the word of God is not a volunteer system. Now, if anyone is upset with that, if anyone isn't happy with that, I will continue reading those very words. That we cannot send ourselves. God has to send us. Is that not very clear enough? But who gets to do if we don't encourage, motivate them, you know, uh, uh, put out some carrot and a stick or whatnot, kind of incentivizing uh, 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 doing God's work. There's no kind of such thing. We can incentivize in places of work by, you know, rewarding good work. You know, if you work very well, you can be incentivized by the prospect of what? Promotion, for instance, or uh, salary increase. But that's not how it works in the work of God. It may work over there. But let's not bring in the world into the church. Let's take the church to the world. That's the whole idea. So the word of God is not, or the preaching of the word of God is not a volunteer. Perhaps it may already have, uh, uh, you might already have thought in your mind. In the whole the years that I've been pastoring this church, not one bit have I even approached anyone here both men and women, to volunteer for preaching. This is the answer. This is the answer. Not my idea. Not my opinion. I'm just obeying the word of God. So all of us, let's all obey the same word. Because this is very crucial for us. Ah, Steve, you're wrong. You see, uh, I say I was a volunteer, remember? Yeah, let's get to that verse. God said his word. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I say, answered, Here I am, send me. Now this is one of the favorite verses in missionary uh, seminars and missionary outreaches and missionary rah 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 meetings to you know fire up the the the, the passion of, of so-called missionaries to go out. This is what it is. You have to be. Uh, you have to have a very strong voluntary spirit. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. We don't just read the Bible where it is and then run away with it. We should understand these verses in the light of the verses before this and the verses after this. And then we will come to realize that these words fit harmoniously with the rest of the Word of God. Why? Why? What happened before these words were asked? of Isaiah and what Isaiah went through. Let's go back seven verses before this because this is the part of the context. This is, if you're familiar with Isaiah chapter 6, is the confrontation of the glory and sinful Isaiah in the temple where the temple was literally transformed into heaven itself and the presence of the glory of God, if you're familiar with that. Let's go back to that. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with a train of his robe filling the, earth, the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one he called out to another and said, the most familiar uh, uh, praise in the whole of the Bible, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory and the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called us. And while the temple was filled with smoke, listen to the reaction of sinful 
I say, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among, among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to him with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. What happened? before Isaiah was put into that situation when God asked who will go for us Isaiah was confronted first with the glory of God in fact many commentators said that this was his conversion because at that moment he was confronted with the glory of God and in light of the brilliance of the majesty of the king of heaven he saw his own unworthiness his own depravity his own sin that he how can he even begin to speak for God when his lips were sinful lips sinful words and so God treated that the cure was cleansing. He touched my mouth with it. Behold, this has touched my, your lips. The coals is a symbol of purification, of cleansing. So before anyone can be sent by God, they have to go through the Isaiah moment of being humble to the dust, of removing all trust away from himself and putting his trust only in God and that he must be confronted with the sovereignty of God and he himself should have stood in awe and wonder at this great God of wonders. And so when we come to verse 8, the reaction was no natural. Here I am, send me. Meaning to say, I'm the only one here in the temple. Well, God enabled him first to even be able to answer, here I am. He cannot say that at all because he was, what, a volunteer? No, God himself enabled him. He saved him. He purified him. He forgave him of his sins. And there's also another thing is that Isaiah wasn't being called to a glamorous job. Isaiah wasn't called into a successful ministry. Isaiah wasn't called in, if, if there was television during that time, perhaps we might have some idea that Isaiah was being called to be a television evangelist, but no, none of those sorts of things. Who would want to be excited to do the things of God in Isaiah's position, if this was what God wanted him to do. Okay, this is what you're going to do, Isaiah. I'm going to send you to a people. And go tell this people, keep on listening but do not perceive. Keep on looking but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. I say, I am going to send you out on a losing proposition to begin with. Do not expect converts. And those who would want still to use in missionary preaching missionary organizational seminars, here I am, send me, and then reading the next verses should stop and reconsider that position because this is a job that is not and it's already programmed to be a failure i said go over to this to these people keep on preaching to them and the more you preach the more they will say no to you and you will not even come home with a single convert what else <laughs> You know, even Isaiah is entitled to, you know, some clarification. So he clarified this to God. He said this, how long will I be doing this? How long will I be preaching to no effect? Preaching without converts? Preaching without winning souls? Well, God said this, how long will you be doing that? Until cities were, are devastated without inhabitants. Houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. 
and the Lord has removed men of far away, and the forsaken place are many in the midst of the land. What is the calling of those who are sent? Faithfulness. What is the successful servant? Those who are faithful. I'm holding my emotions right now, but here's what I'm going to say in the light of these verses. I am prepared to preach the word of God in as much clarity and gift that is given to me, even though the numbers in this church will go down to one pe people, one person. Because that doesn't really matter, isn't it? When we are thinking about the sendingness of the message, it's not popularity, it's not about tradition, it's not about numbers, it's about Him. It's about God's will, it's about God's way. What if we are being called for that? Do we make a choice and say, mm, Lord, I don't like that. I like television evangelists. There was one person here. Many of you probably wouldn't have come to know him, but he came here for a while. And he was a graduate of a divinity school somewhere. I said, you're fine. You find uh, God is... Uh, will is calling you here, we'll, 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 take, we'll take you up on that and let's, let's uh, see what happens and pray. And he said, no, I'm not really interested in a small church ministry. I said, why? Because I want to be a successful television evangelist. I said, why? Oh, you don't know why. There's more money in television evangelism. God is calling faithful men and women, committed men and women right now. If that speaks of who you are, then be encouraged. Be encouraged to be part of the work here in Midland Park. Because while things like this in Isaiah happens, God isn't you know, uh, stingy. I still believe God is generous. And I still believe, perhaps maybe not in my lifetime, that I am seeing a lot of people here overfilling this place. True men and women, humbled by God, repented of their sins, trusting only in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There has always been a question about the sent. Who are the sent? Those who have been sent. There's always this question about, it happens in management schools, the, the recurring question about, are leaders born or made? Are managers born or made? And so there will be one group in the class who will take up the position that they are made. Another group will, will take the position that they are born and the, the, the teacher or the professor will sit down in delight as these two groups would debate each other. Because in a sense, it's like a chicken and an egg argument. Because according to the word of God, those who are sent out by God is not born or not made. They're chosen. The word of the Lord came to me, I say, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I loved you, I knew you, I paid careful attention of you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't, you know, change his mind on someone else who have not done anything, anything at all about ministry, then after some time, in a, one point in his life, he's charged into the forefront of the ministry. That doesn't happen. Why do I say that? That's not my opinion. My opinion is the word of God. And if you find anything else that's contrary to the words that I've been reading to you before, please do me a big favor, show it to me. Because sending is the work of God. 
Sending is not by lottery, is not by the suffrage of God's people, by the popular vote of God's people. It is the sending of the three persons in the Godhead at Sorry, I missed that. But let me just go back to it. The Father sends, the Son sends, and the Holy Spirit sends. Let me just pick up some uh, verses here. The Father sends. Jesus said that to his disciples. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. I cannot send you. To be honest, that's what probably you're wondering. Why is Steve not doing anything about the next pastor or pastors in the church? Well, I will tell you that later on as we move along. But it is not our business. It is the business of the Father to send workers into the harvest. I cannot even send myself, to be honest. I cannot do that. Because right now, if I'm doing that, I'd run away from this pulpit. But that's already, in a way, been settled already. Long time in my life. John chapter 13, 19 to 20. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth, whoever accepts anyone, I send. He was talking to his disciples. Jesus here speaking as the sending authority. I am sending you. Okay, the Father sends the Son sends. The Holy Spirit sends. Paul speaking to the elders of Ephesus as he was about to leave the place, he spoke to them at Miletus in the port city of Miletus before he boarded his ship. He talked to these elders. He said to these elders, to the leaders of the church, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. It's the Holy Spirit that makes overseers. So I know I've been talking theoretically at this time. How do we connect all of this to ground level? How does it look like at ground level? Does God directly send someone? No, he uses instrumentation. Two ways. Two ways. And this is where the church comes in. The church comes in. God works his sending authority through the instrumentality of the church. Listen. And they were at Antioch. In the church that was there, prophets and teachers, they were the eldership at that time, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, he was black. There's a point here why it is said here he is a Niger. Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who, was a, uh, who, was, who came from the rich. So this is actually an odd group of men to be put together to lead a church. But they came from all sorts of background, and they lead the church. And while they were serving, ministering to the Lord and fasting, listen, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Who sent them away? The church. Was it because they have the democratic power? No. It was the Holy Spirit who sent them out. And the church, in obedience and sensitivity to the Spirit, carried out that mandate of the Holy Spirit. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, verse 4, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. This is not a suggestion. This is not a suggestion to say, oh, well, you know what? Maybe you can use the church. You want to be sent? Go to a church and ask them to send you and... That does it. That is not the way it works. You see, there's so much to take away from here, but in our days today, because of traditionalism, of denominationalism, of non-denominationalism, there is a neglect of the church in this regard. To do church is just come, maybe be busy, volunteer for something or that, or become a member and be active and so on and so forth. But that's not the picture I'm reading from here. There's a, there's a, 
there's a united spirit a being in the spirit of sending now who were sent not all of the churches were sent actually that happened when the church in jerusalem was scattered we'll take a look at that in a mo uh, next time but here we see the instrumentality the cruciality if there's an english word for that the crucial aspect of the church being the only sending instrument god has given in these days i'm not promoting tbs but that's one of my thanksgiving to the lord to see tbs not because i graduated from it or because we're connected with because that is one of the very few institution of theological learning that is managed by the church today even you know uh, parachurches churches are doing their own thing you know edward so and so evangelistic crusade i'm good to go let's do it there's so much uh, so much adventurism out there so much commercialism out there so much of this you know free spirited free market economy application to the work of god when it is very simple the point here is that let me do the decision god is saying that let me do the sending can't you even respect me for that maybe this is the one of the things that why god is withholding those blessings right now because even that very small thing of doing his way doing god's work in his way is something that we just take for granted perhaps some of the things becomes clear now why i do things in this church this way i need to explain that because that is where i'm coming from oh yes steve that's correct okay i get that how authoritative is the church? Well, after they ran around the first missionary journey, they sailed back to Antioch. Who are the day? The missionary team. It's not only Barnabas and Paul. There were other people with them. And from which they had commended to the grace of God, the church who commended the, them to the grace of God. And what did they do in verse 27? When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all the things that God has done to them and how they have opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Oh, such beautiful accountability beautiful submission to the plan and purposes of god there is so much individualism in today and i borrow that word i read it somewhere expressive individualism is the thing today that everything is to be determined by the personal decision of the individual and that becomes the right and wrong of ethics and even these things has been influenced but we see I don't know with you, perhaps it's not as, correct, as true right now that my kids are grown up and they're adults, but when they were still younger, whether you call it coptering or not, I don't care. But I want my kids to, to let me know where they are going, how long will they be there, with whom are they with, and what time are they coming back. Why? Well, that's responsibility. She is the mother, I'm the father. Responsibility, accountability are now being destroyed by expressive individualism and that is very, very anti-scriptural. And that's what's happening right now in terms of mission work and evangelism work. Okay, Steve, you have not yet answered my question. Um, yeah, the church, and uh, how do we go about it? There was one person here whose son graduated from seminary, and that father wanted to shop around for a place for his son to pastor. Now, that boy has passed away now, and he asked me the question, Steve, how does one become a pastor in the church? Fair question. Well, let's, let's go to the Word of God. It is the task of the church, yes, we covered that, but it is 
part of the task of those who are already sent. Where do I read that? Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in their capacity as in their authority as those who, be, who were sent as apostles. They cannot, Paul and Barnabas cannot arrogate that authority to themselves to do that. They can only do so because they were sent themselves to begin with. And so they appointed elders, elders, uh, pastors, uh, teachers in each of the church with prayer and fasting, committing them to the Lord in whom they have put their trust. And that's why we read this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, and the things that you have heard from me, who is Paul talking here? He's talking to Titus, oh sorry, he's talking to Timothy. Timothy is a, is a special office, by the way. It's a non-continuing, no one can be in the same place as Timothy right now because he was an apostolic assistant. Paul says this to Timothy, his own personal understudy. The things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What have we just read? The simple application on the ground level of what it means to commission with the sendingness, blessing, and authority of God. Without the support of Pastor Butcher, I have said no to him many times. And he keeps saying no. And it now becomes my trust. And sorry if you think I'm not playing favorites because I won't do that. I'm sorry if I'm not giving you any favors to give you some importance because that's not my job to do. But it has become my accountability that I will entrust this faithful trust to those who are trustworthy and will entrust this to others also. Actually, the apostles and the early church were faithful to this. The apostles, they trained people under them. Titus, Timothy fits the bill. And then after them, like uh, uh, Polycarp of Smyrna, Ignatius of Antioch, Clement of Rome, they were trained by the Apostle John, and this layer was called the Apostolic Fathers, and the Apostolic Fathers, they trained the second succeeding leaders after them, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian of Carthage, Theophilus of Antioch, were considered the early church fathers in the late second century, and so on and so forth, but everything blew out of proportion, and, and, and we are here right now with all of these practices. Sorry, I, my bad, and I overshoot the, the, the time, but let me just uh, uh, recap everything very, sh very quickly. We know we have a task to do. We are part of the ministry. It's not by accident that you are here, but one important thing that we have learned is the I say a moment. What does the I say a moment teach us? Before going to speak for God, this is very important. Worship first. This is a very uh, familiar verse, the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples, it's verse 19. But what, ha what happens before verse 19? This is what happened in verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. How important worship? Well, let me show me a church who does the work of the Lord, and I will show you how they worship, essentially. That was the point of Isaiah. Isaiah needs to be confronted with the holy God and worship him before he can even begin to speak for him. And let me repeat this over and over again. There is no other way but God's way. If anyone wants to compete in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Let's not try to make up the rules. Not, not, let's not try to reinvent missions and evangelism. Let's not try to send ourselves. Let's not run without being sent. Let's not reinvent the Great Commission. The true believer is not self-willed, but seeks to submit his will under the authority of God and the authority of the scripture. For in the word of God is our shelter. In the word of God is our comfort. I have to end now. We'll continue next time. Let us pray. 
our Father and God, there are so many ideas, opinions of men that crowds are thinking. Forgive us, O God, if we don't give importance to your word and make the word, your word, as the final authority in all our beliefs and practices. Lord, we desire for men, many men, and I pray, O oh God, that may you raise up men and women whom you have sent and give us that sense of the Spirit as well by the light of the word that they are so. And so, Lord, may you grow your work here in this place and save sinners according to your will and mercy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We will sing. Last hymn. This may not be familiar to many, but uh, the words are as meaningful. We will sing, We have a gospel to proclaim. As we bring our service to a close with the word of the benediction, let us pray. Lord, bless you and keep you. The Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And now, may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be all like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you, with one mind and one mouth, proclaim the good news of salvation Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>